In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation on this beautiful Solemnity of Christ the King. Long live Christ the King, que viva Cristo Rey. Of course, where there's a king, there's always a queen. So let's invite Mary to be with us. Mary is the queen that we celebrate. We pray every time we pray the last glorious mystery. Mary is crowned as queen of heaven and earth. So let's uh, pray the prayer that Mary loves most. And that prayer is the Hail Mary. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. Mary is also known as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's turn to Mary and ask Mary to pray for us that Christ will reign, that he will be the king of the universe, starting with her own lives. So we say the prayer that Mary loves most. That's the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let us invite our spiritual director to be with us. <clears throat> our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the known as the paraclete. It's also known as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. Holy Spirit is also known as our counselor. He's also our consoler. Holy Spirit is our sanctifier, he who helps us to grow in holiness. Also the Holy Spirit is our interior master. As the great apostle to the Gentiles, St. Paul points out, we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's uh, ask the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light, a lot of peace, a lot of joy. As we pray. <laughs> Excuse me. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful. And enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. Mary, Queen of Angels and Saints, pray for us. Lord St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, 
pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. Blessed Miguel Pro, pray for us. Blessed Jose Maria Sancho del Rio, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Rejoice in the Lord, I say it again, rejoice in the Lord. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Yes, my friends, today, as the church celebrates with great joy the solemnity of Christ the King, we'd like to lift up our minds, our hearts, our souls, to praise Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the King of all hearts, on this wonderful, wonderful solemnity of Christ the King. And as always, we'd like to encourage all of you, we're promising to pray for you in the greatest of all prayers. And that prayer is the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. That's right. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. No greater prayer in the world than the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So in this prayer, I'd like to offer the following intentions. The following intentions are, first, I'd like to pray that all of us would be open to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. That's right, all of us would be open to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. This can be our prayer today. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention will be for our ongoing permanent formation that all of us would make an effort not to stagnate in our spiritual life nor to stagnate intellectually but strive to grow in our knowledge and understanding of our Catholic faith so that we can transmit this our Catholic faith to others of course, we know that we cannot give what we don't have. We don't have this deep <clears throat> knowledge and love for Christ and his church and the word of God, then how are we going to educate others, starting with our own family members? So let's try to get to study our faith on a, on a daily basis. Ask your spiritual director what would be the, the first step to take to pursue ongoing formation. My third intention will be I'd like to pray for the conversion of sinners. Especially especially for especially for the conversion of poor sinners, those who are dying. Those who are dying. 
especially those who are dying in the state of sin. For those who are dying in the state of sin, that they would be converted. So, my friends, those are the those are my intentions I'd like to place on the altar for you today. So, as we enter into this great solemnity, which is that of Christ the King, I'd like to just. Review where we are in the in the church year. We start the church year with the celebration of Advent, which will be next week. Four Sundays in which we prepare ourselves for the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then we celebrate the birth of Christ Christmas Eve. Christmas season lasts, lasts about two and a half weeks. And we enter into ordinary time. Ordinary time for about seven weeks. Then we enter into the season of Lent with Ash Wednesday. The 40 days of Lent. Which culminates in Holy Week. Starting with Palm Sunday. In the very heart of Holy Week would be the, what's called the Easter Triduum. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. Culminating with the celebration of Easter. Saturday evening we celebrate the Vigil Mass of Easter. Then that whole week we celebrate Easter up until the following Sunday, which is Divine Mercy Sunday. Then we have Easter season, which lasts 50 days. 40 days after our Lord rose from the dead, the church technically celebrates the ascension of our Lord into heaven. Then the apostles enter with Mary into the upper room of the cenacle, and they're there for nine days and nine nights, praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that's Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit in fire. Then, after the solemnity of Pentecost, which is the birthday of the church. Then we enter into the longer period of ordinary time. However, there are three chief solemnities back to back. And that would be the celebration of celebration of the Blessed Trinity. Then we have the celebration of Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Christ. Then the following Friday, we actually celebrate the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Then we enter into the long period of ordinary time, which takes us up to what we celebrate today. And today is the solemnity of Christ the King, Christ the King of the Universe. So that's where we're at liturgically. So next Sunday, we'll actually be entering into a new year. We have the civil new year, January 1st, but we also have the church new year, which is the first Sunday in Advent. 
I'd like to thank God because uh, last night I went with my missionary Ignatian team to give the last presentation of the spiritual exercises in St. Joseph's in Pomona. It's a very great experience. We were warmly welcomed by Father Stephen and we were able to start with celebrating the Mass and then we gave a talk each day for 10 weeks and they broke, broke up into groups, they had wonderful sharing groups and the people were really overflowing with joy. It's a lot of joy. And my last talk was encouraging them to persevere. So 10-week program sets the foundation for a, a spiritual edifice of holiness. We set the foundation. Now it's incumbent upon them to, to build upon that. So you asked to, I asked you to pray for the people in Pomona as well as in Paramount. We're still finishing the last touches of our work in Our Lady of the Rosary in Paramount. So pray for these group of people. We're working with four to five hundred people uh, on in these two different groups. So there's a lot of souls to sanctify and save. If they're sanctified, they're going to be touching their families, family members. They call it the spiritual domino effect. <clears throat> so pray for these people who are doing the spiritual exercises. And <clears throat> also, as I've mentioned over the past week, today, after the 12 o'clock Mass at 1.30, we'll be starting a, a new program. And this program will be based on my last book, which came out about five weeks ago. And it's the Marian Compendium. We're inviting all of you to come at 1.30 in the Old Church Building in St. Peter Chanel to, to really get to know Mary better. To really get to know Mary better. I already wrote a book on Mary, consecrating ourselves to Jesus through the mystery of the rosary and the seven sorrows. This one's more <clears throat> uh, comprehensive in the sense that it goes through uh, Marian devotion and dogmas and beautiful prayers, wonderful art. I'm very, very happy that this, this new work of mine was finally released and Basically, it's, it's going like hotcakes. People are, many, many people are buying this book. Some are buying two, four. One lady bought ten, two times. And so it's, uh, it's just flying off the, off the shelf. And um, thanks be to God. And my purpose is to get people to love Mary. And Mary will bring them to the heart of Christ. And then salvation. That's really why we're here. We want... Christ to reign in our hearts so that he will reign in heaven forever as our eternal king. So my friends, uh, I'd like to enter into this wonderful solemnity of Christ the King. And um, I'd like to go through these readings and Really focus on what does it really mean? What does it really mean? The whole solemnity of Christ the King. What does it mean to the world? What does it mean to the church? What does it mean to our country? What does it mean to our families? What does it mean to our church groups? What does it mean to ourselves? So what is this? This, uh, this beautiful solemnity of Christ the King, what does it really mean to us? So we'll, we'll talk about that. So as always, we, um, we have three readings. First reading is, <clears throat> verse reading is taken <clears throat> from the second book of Samuel 
chapter 5, one, verse 1 to 3. So what we have is the person of of David. <clears throat> now the Israelites begged God to give them a king. The Lord said that he did not want initially to have a king over Israel because he wanted to reign. But they insisted. Now if you read through the book of Kings, and Samuel. These are called the historical books of the Old Testament. You're going to notice that there were a lot of pretty bad kings. Others mediocre. And a few good kings. And the best of all the kings was King David. Who was the type or symbol of Christ the King. Even though David did have his fall with Bathsheba and then killing Bathsheba's husband, still David had David had a good heart. David repented. We see that in Psalm 51 after the prophet Nathan gives him the parable, how it's related to David himself, had taken advantage, utilizing, abusing his power. <laughs> So, today's first reading, is it, it, it's short, but uh, to the point. So what you have today is all the tribes of Israel, they come before David in Hebron. And they say to him, here, here we are, we're bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh. He said, in the days that passed, Saul was our king, but it was you who led the Israelites out and brought them back. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people, Israel, and you shall be commander of Israel. When all the elders of Israel came to David and Hebron, King David made an agreement with them before the Lord. And then they anointed, they anointed him king of Israel. So the one idea that I'd like to pull out here is that one of the key concepts in the Bible images is that of shepherd and sheep. Shepherd and sheep. David will go on to write many of the Psalms. Many of the Psalms. Among which the most famous of all the Psalms would be the Psalm of the Good Shepherd. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. He leads me beside restful waters. He gives peace to my soul. Even though I have to walk through dark valleys, I fear no evil. Because you are with me with your rod and your staff. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. I believe that I will live in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? That's Psalm 23. And David will become the shepherd of the house of Israel. Earlier, he's anointed by Samuel when David is simply a shepherd tending the sheep of his father, Jesse. And Samuel comes in, the prophet, and says, God has sent me to anoint one of your sons as shepherd. 
they're brought into Samuel, and Samuel said, not him, not him, not him, not him. Is there anyone left? Jesse says, well, there's the youngest one in the field. He's tending the sheep. Bring him in. Once Samuel saw him, he looked ruddy, handsome, good appearance. And Samuel said, he's the one. Anoint him. So Samuel anointed David. And it says, from that moment, the Holy Spirit rushed upon David. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit would rush upon us today. Impetuously, powerfully. The Holy Spirit will really rush upon David. As you rush upon David, that he would rush upon us also. Rushing upon David, may the Holy Spirit rush upon us. So David is a shepherd to his flock. Jesus will take the good shepherd and he'll actually apply it to himself. That's right. Jesus in John chapter 10, John chapter 10, will go on to say, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I know each by name. The true shepherd is not like the marauder or the mercenary who comes only for pay. Once he sees the wolf, he takes flight. But I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd knows his sheep. And the good shepherd is willing to lay down his life for a sheep. I've come that you have life and life in abundance. So these are images from the Old Testament. They apply to Christ. Christ is the good shepherd and he is our king. The response to a real psalm. <clears throat> The responsorial psalm is taken from Psalm 122. The antiphon is, let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Every Sunday, my friends, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Every Sunday. Every Sunday is a mini-resurrection. Feast Day of Christ the King points to the ascension of Jesus, where he ascends to heaven, seats at the right hand of God the Father, and he's the King. It also points to the second coming of Christ, where he will separate the goats from the sheep. Also, every Sunday points to the to Easter, the resurrection, where Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. The very heart and center of every Sunday, Pope John Paul II highlighted this in his document, which he wrote in the early 90s, 90s the Day of the Lord. But John Paul II says we have to rediscover the, the, the holy character of Sundays. Many places, Sunday is just becoming an extension of Saturday, the weekend mentality. Rather, Sunday should be the very heart of our, the very heart of our spiritual life. We're celebrating the resurrection of Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So today, let's go to Mass. Let us go rejoicing. Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Jesus is, is, is in his temple. He's in his tabernacle. In his real presence. Then we move into the Second reading taken from St. Paul to the Colossians, which is a beautiful Christological hymn. 
where St. Paul waxes eloquent explaining who Christ is in very sublime words. But Paul starts out by saying brothers and sisters. That's important. That we are brothers and sisters. In our perseverance family, we come together as brothers and sisters. If God is our Father, Jesus Christ is our brother and our King, that means that all of us are brothers and sisters in Christ. If we say, Our Father who art in heaven, God is Father, Christ our brother, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. By the way, in the Our Father, we also say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's right. And Paul, Paul goes on to say, Let us give thanks to the Father who has made you fit to share in the inheritance of the Holy Ones in light. He's saying we should be thankful for our baptism, which transformed us into sons and daughters of God. Sons and daughters of the King. We've got Jesus Christ as King and Mary as our Queen. Paul goes on to say that he delivered us from the power of darkness and transformed us to the kingdom, to the kingdom, Christ the King, of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. So in this, we want to thank the Lord Thank the Lord for the fact that we have become <clears throat> members of his mystical body, the church, through our baptism. We have been delivered from the power of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. And we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. My friends, what a blessing it is to be forgiven our sins. What a blessing it is to go to confession. What a blessing it is to receive absolution. What a blessing it is that we know we're forgiven by the King of Kings who shed his blood for us. What a blessing it is for many of us to have made a general confession getting rid of all of our sins. What a blessing it is. What a blessing it is to live with our conscience at peace and no longer have to carry about within us the guilt that weighs down upon our conscience, our hearts, our minds, our souls. So that's a point I'd like to lay upon you from Colossians 1, 12 to 20. There's more in which St. Paul really waxes eloquent, given the beautiful titles of who Christ is, the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. Beautiful Christological hymn from the first chapter of Colossians. You know, in the Alleluia, we don't comment too much upon that verse, but today I'd just like to mention it. The Alleluia verse is, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father, David, that is to come. That's referring to um, Palm Sunday, where Jesus is proclaimed as King of Israel. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Now, my friends, we move from the first reading from Samuel to the Responsorial Psalm to the letter of Paul to Colossians. We now enter into the, the gospel. Now, 
just an overview of the Gospels that the Church offers us for the feast day of Christ the King. Sundays, there is a three-year three cycle. There's cycle A, B, and C. Cycle A, we have the Gospel of St. Matthew. Cycle B, we have the Gospel of St. Mark. Cycle C, we have the Gospel of St. Luke. In the Gospel of St. John, we have in the many important passages in Holy Week, Easter Sunday, as well as the Easter season. So St. John is basically kind of cut up and placed into key, other key uh, moments in the church year. But year A, Matthew. Year B, Mark. Year C, Luke. So the three different Gospels were in year C now. But if you're next, uh, next year, starting in a week, we go from year C to year A. So next year at this time, you'll have the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, where the king will separate on the day of judgment. He'll separate the goats from the sheep. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was naked. I was a foreigner. I was sick. I was in prison. Whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. We hope that we will see Christ in the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the foreigner, the prisoner, and the sick. That should be our desire, to, to see Christ in all, but especially those who are most lonely and the suffering ones of the world. Then year B, we have Mark for the feast day of Christ the King. And Christ is before Pontius Pilate. Pilate says, so you are a king. You have said it. But he was not a king of this world. He says, if I wanted to, I could call the angels from heaven to free me. But my kingdom is not of this world. So that's year B with St. Mark. Well, today we have year three. It's the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 23, verse 35 to 43. What we have is we have Christ crucified on the cross. That's right, Christ crucified on the cross. So in this, this wonderful meditation that we meditate upon on Good Friday, as well as Palm Sunday, I'd like to give you the, the overall context and the interpretation of it and the application. That's my style, to give the overall context, get the biblical context in our mind. Then what does it mean to us? How, what does it mean? And then how, how can we put this into practice? So this is Good Friday. Jesus has already been nailed to the cross. He's hanging on the cross. And surrounding the cross, there are various different individuals. Various different individuals. We have some of the rulers come, they start to sneer at Christ. They start to mock him, to deride him. They say, he saved others. Let him save himself. If 
He's the chosen one, the Christ of God. So not only is Christ crucified by these evil men, but even when he's hanging on the cross, they're still making fun of him. Those would be the the rulers of the people. Then you got the soldiers. So the the Jewish rulers and leaders are mocking Christ. Then you have the soldiers who jeered at him. They mocked him. They derided him. They laughed at him. So they approached to offer him some wine. They cry out, if you're the if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, here I have a cross for you. So he's on the cross. You cannot see it too clearly, but you can see above the cross. Above the cross, you see there is an inscription. I'm trying to get as close to you as possible. You really can't see the letters on it. The letters are there, but they're very small. Let's see if we can get it as close as possible, almost touching the screen. Well, even if you can't see it, you, you know, you know what those letters are. So those letters are the following. So I'll write it in big print for you. These are the letters. Now the condemnation of the criminal, this would be carried before the criminal by an individual indicating his crime. And this time it was actually written in three languages because there are three different cultures back then. You had the intellectual culture, which would be the Greeks. You had the political powers of the world, would be the Roman, Romans. Then you had the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders. So you had the intellectuals, the political power, and the religious power. So it actually was written in Greek, in Latin, and Aramaic, the language of Christ. So this would be the Latin form. Jesus Nazarena Rex Judeus. In in English it would be Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. So that would be the interpretation of those letters. The Jewish people opposed this, but Pontius Pilate said, What is written is written. Let's move on with the biblical text. So we have the rulers are mocking him, sneering at him. You got the soldiers jeering at him. Now if that were not enough, if that were not enough, as Christ hangs on the cross, there's one man on his left, and then there's another man on his right. These were the thieves that were condemned to be crucified with Christ. According to tradition, these, uh, these, these uh, thieves were condemned. Christ was nailed to the cross. But these thieves were actually roped to the cross. There are various ways in which the Romans could uh, could condemn the criminals. Christ was nailed. They were roped. That meant that those who were roped, obviously the 
the process of death would be prolonged. So what we have is The Gospel of Luke does not present it this way, but another Gospel of Mark presents both of them, both of them at first. This is the Gospel of Mark. Both of them at first, they were, they railed against Christ, they attacked Christ, they insulted Christ. So he's being insulted by the rulers, the soldiers, and now even the thieves. And what happens is one of them says, are you not the Christ? Which means the anointed, how David was anointed. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now there's a change of heart of the other thief. There's a change of heart. What's happened is one of the thieves is imbued with grace and he corresponds to grace. He's becoming more and more aware that the person that's next to him is not an ordinary person. But the person next to him is God. He's heard the words of Christ who says, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. He's heard his words, I thirst. He's heard those words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's heard those words that this man addressed to his mother and his best friend. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. So he's moved by the, the gentleness, the mercy, the love, the holiness, the real holiness that's emanating from this man who hangs on the cross. So as the other thief, like the rulers and the soldiers, attacks Christ verbally, he comes to his defense. And he goes on to say, rebuking the other, have you no fear of God? Have you no fear of God? For you are subject to the same condemnation. And indeed, we have been condemned justly. Saying it's our fault. We're here because of what we've done. For the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes. But this man has done nothing criminal. To hear in the passage is the only person that defends Christ. The rulers are attacking him. The soldiers are attacking him. Both of the thieves at first attack him. Then this one changes. And the other thief continues to attack him, but he defends Christ. But this man has done nothing criminal. Then this thief says something. One of the most beautiful, powerful verses in the whole gospel. 
And Jesus is listening to this very attentively. Then he said, Jesus, remember me. Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That Jesus is listening. He's listening to all these insults and he's forgiving these people. Now this thief turns to the Lord begging for mercy. Begging for mercy. These are the words of Jesus. And with these words, the gospel concludes. Amen. I say to you. Today. Today. You will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. This conversation between Jesus the the two thieves is very touching they both start to attack him and then this 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 good thief this good thief would lived a very bad life you know most likely he was a he was a thief possibly a murderer, an insurrectionist, starting starting wars. I mean, he, he lived a bad life. I mean, probably most of his life. Lived a very bad life. And even the beginning of the process, he was attacking Christ. But God sent him abundance of grace, and he opened up his his ears, his mind, his heart to the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ. So until the very air, till the very end, my friends, there is hope. And I just like to go through it. So it's so profound. I invite you to try to plumb the depths of this beautiful this beautiful biblical passage as we ourselves, we, we honor, praise, and worship Jesus Christ as our King. Save yourself and save us. Good Thief says, have you no fear of God? You are subject to the same condemnation. Indeed, we have been condemned justly for the sentence we receive correspond to our crimes, but this man has done nothing criminal. He's defending Christ. He's defending Christ. Then he says, Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord responds, Amen, I say to you, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. It's interesting that with this one act of love, of trust, this one act, act of love and trust toward Christ. 
this man living a very bad life. This man, all of, all of his sins were forgiven. As well as the temporal punishment due to his sins, they were washed clean. For that reason, the Bible says, love covers a multitude of sins. Don't you love that? Love covers a multitude of sins. So my friends, irrespective of what we've done in our lives, Maybe our lives up to this point have not been that good, irrespective of our pasts. In the present moment, Christ loves you. In the future, he wants you to be with him in heaven. So like the good thief, let us beg the Lord for mercy let us beg the Lord for mercy for the whole world. Let us beg the Lord for mercy for our country. Let us beg the Lord for mercy for our church. Let us beg the Lord for mercy for our families, for our young people. Let us beg the Lord mercy for our own personal sins. May Jesus Christ the King reign. May he reign in our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our souls, in time and for all eternity. Que viva Cristo Rey, que viva Maria Reina. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.